As one of Red Hat's most strategic and experienced global systems integrators, Accenture fosters continuous innovation in open source. For more than a decade, Accenture has proven to be a trusted collaborator, bringing skilled professionals with business acumen, deep industry expertise to the Red Hat ecosystem. Now, please welcome Accenture's Adam Burden, Executive Director, Cloud Application and Platform Services to the 2012 Red Hat Summit. I should probably know what song that is, but I have no idea, so thank you. Well, thank you for the warm welcome. I appreciate uh, everyone uh, coming this morning. Uh, you know, in, in preparation, rehearsing for uh, coming in uh, today and speaking with you, I was actually looking at some of the videos uh, from last year, and uh, one of the speakers had gotten up in the morning and says, well, you know, the crowd, crowd's kind of sparse this morning. I guess, the, uh, uh, I guess the, you know, the parties last night were pretty good. So evidently, Red Hat didn't throw very many parties last night. It's good to see everybody here, so thank you for, for coming on time. Um, I am uh, happy to talk to you about a very interesting story. I think I, I did a little informal poll beforehand, uh, and I think about maybe two-thirds of folks uh, had not heard of this story before, so hopefully it'll be a little bit new and entertaining for some of you. But I think it has very real applications uh, in, in what we do and what we're dealing with every day in our clients' businesses. Um, so what I'm hoping to do over the next uh, several minutes is really inspire folks in here to use the tools that they have uh, to think a little bit differently about either their organi organization's collections of applications um, or their clients or how they're going to approach rationalizing things. This is a really serious uh, challenge for many of our clients that they're dealing with today. And I think that our partners from Red Hat and the other ecosystem partners that Accenture works with, uh, that we can bring some really interesting solutions to help them resolve them. So let me start by actually telling you a little bit about Accenture and uh, our partnership with Red Hat. Um, you know, it surprises me that we're, we're one of the world's largest consultancies and sometimes uh, people just don't know who we are. Um, so we have uh, almost 250,000 employees. We work in 120 different countries around the world. Um, we have about uh, 40,000 Java developers, uh, so some, some of a standing army of Java developers. Uh, and we serve uh, many of the Fortune 500 uh, clients that are out there. Uh, I myself, I'm uh, um, going to give you a bit of an introduction in just a second, uh, but I am one of those delivery people. I'm out working, uh, delivering client services just like many of our employees uh, do every day. Um, we've been working with Red Hat for a long time. They are one of our most important uh, business partners. Uh, we have a, a long track record with them, uh, more than a decade uh, at this point. Uh, and when we work with Red Hat, uh, it's more often than not in scenarios where we're delivering large, complex uh, enterprise business solutions. Uh, so we're putting in some of the very co most complex uh, business architectures or uh, leading edge uh, applications and systems, and our clients want to have those delivered and installed on Red Hat because uh, of its ability to deliver bulletproof results for them. Uh, so we're proud to have uh, had that partnership for a long time, and it's paid a lot of dividends. Now, Accenture is taking our army of 40,000 Java developers, and we are introducing some new things to them, getting them ready to do some de application development uh, in cloud on some of the platform as a service architectures are out there. In fact, we just had a, uh, a, a, an Accenture-wide prize we called the J Prize, uh, which was uh, encouraging our Java developers really across our organization uh, to use OpenShift uh, to develop some creative applications. And we uh, just concluded that prize, and I think that at some point during the, the sessions uh, over the next couple of days, we're actually going to share uh, some of the results of that. But one of the things that, that really I, I found pretty remarkable there was the ability for our uh, Java developers uh, to very quickly become extremely productive in this. It was, it was not uh, something that required a lot of training. Uh, it was something that they could become very comfortable with almost immediately and become productive and begin developing uh, in OpenShift. And I know that that is going to make a big difference uh, for the adoption of OpenShift uh, and certainly what we're seeing uh, in our clients' interests regarding that. Let me uh, tell you a little bit of background about myself and get into why, um, you know, why or where this topic actually came from. So I've actually been with Accenture a long time, 20 years. Uh, 20 years next week, actually. I'm, a, uh, I'm one of the folks in our organization we label as a master technology architect. 
Um, and I actually drew that diagram on the other side of the slide there. I'm not very proud of it, to be perfectly honest, uh, but I did draw that at one point, and I'm gonna come back to it a little bit later and tell you why that's important. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have a career of client delivery. Uh, yesterday, uh, I was with uh, clients here in Boston uh, before I, I came over, um, and in fact, tomorrow, uh, that's exactly where I'm heading as well. Um, I have a couple of leadership roles in Accenture, and, and I have to tell you, I have one of the greatest jobs in the world because I get to work at the intersection of old and new. So I'm responsible globally for what we do in application modernization, that's taking older legacy systems um, and extending their useful life. Uh, and then I also lead our cloud applications and platforms. So certainly that's important for what we deliver net new, uh, but what I think is even more compelling is how do we take what's old uh, and make it new in the cloud? And here's what I'm gonna share with you about that. So one of the challenges that, that I run into in going and speaking with some of our Fortune 500 clients, whether it's here in North America, uh, in Europe, or even in, in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, is this issue of technology debt uh, or application debt. Um, to put it in perspective, most of the clients that we work with have about an average of about a thousand different applications. Now, you can argue uh, and debate a little bit about kind of what is an application, but these are the real business systems that kind of run their back office, uh, and a thousand of them is an almost um, inconceivable number in some cases, especially when you consider that there's some clients that actually have more than 10,000 of them. And when you begin to, to look at kind of the details of, of what does this really mean to their organizations, it, it really is tying them up almost. Uh, and uh, that knot on the other side there, I think is referred to as a Turkish knot. Uh, there's no ends that are visible and it's a very difficult knot to actually untie. Um, our clients are, are telling us this when we do our surveys of, of Accenture um, clients and organizations that are out there, what we hear from them, more than 80% of them are telling us this is their, one of their biggest issues, if not the biggest issue that's on their mind right now is how do they untangle this application portfolio and make it more nimble so that they can be more responsive to their business. Now, I have the good fortune of being in our modernization practice, so a lot of times our clients come in and they ask us, uh, can you help us at least develop a plan uh, about what it is that we should do this? So one of the first things that we do is we take a look at what they have. And do you know that when we do this, we actually find that about one in three of the applications that they have in their portfolios are actually not used or redundant. It means that they're functionally almost identical uh, to others. This is a pretty standard statistic. I won't tell you I find it in every portfolio, but certainly it's something that we run into pretty regularly. So this Custom legacy, uh, the issue inside of this, um, and it's especially persistent with custom legacy uh, applications. So these are the things that are running on mainframes or older applications, especially problematic there. And our clients, the, the CIOs, our business, the business leaders, they're really sort of in a difficult spot. These are our very biggest um, you know, industries in the world. Um, they're threatened by startups every day who are a little bit more nimble, a little bit more responsive to their customers and clients. Uh, they can't really rip and replace the big applications that they already have, but they also can't afford not to go and fix it. Uh, and there are lots of ways to address this, and I would tell you that there's more often than not been some type of analysis that's always been done about our with our clients about how it is they can rationalize these things and what their next step should be, um, but oftentimes that actually becomes a little bit of shelfware. And that's disappointing because there's ways to do that, and I think if you apply some of the things from uh, what we get with Red Hat, uh, and some of our other ecosystem of partners, uh, you can make a real difference in your enterprise. So let me tell you a little bit of a story. Uh, this is uh, an area of the world that's uh, over in the kind of Middle East uh, area, uh, and this is a map from about 2,000 years ago. And uh, about 2,000 years ago, this area was lots of warring factions. They had um, uh, dictators uh, basically running uh, some of the regions. Actually, it's, it's not all that different today. Uh, but we've got, uh, so, so we've got, uh, you know, a really difficult uh, place of the world uh, that's really, um, you know, uh, in, in flux at this point. And at, at one point there was a, um, a leader uh, that, that, that emerged, and his name was uh, Midas, uh, and uh, he basically uh, came into town, uh, he'd heard about this oracle uh, prediction that somebody would come into town uh, riding in an ox cart, uh, and they would become, you know, the leader of Macedonia so to speak. Uh, so he did this, uh, he, he, he uh, basically was an opportunist and decided that he would head into town in Oxcart and soon enough he was you know, basically the leader of this, of this esteemed group in Macedonia. And uh, one of the things that he did was he said, well, I'm gonna pay tribute to my good fortune here, I'm gonna tie my Oxcart 
uh, to this, um, basically this temple I've built in honor of my good fortune. I'm gonna tie it up with this really complex knot, a Turkish knot, you know, hence became, was actually in the city of Gordium, and hence became known as the Gordian, uh, the Gordian knot. Um, that particular knot, um, you know, that was really never, um, you know, proposed. It was originally, it was like somebody, you know, unties this, you know, they'll become, you know, the uh, you know, leader of the free world or anything. Uh, but you know how legends grow over time. So people became in awe of this puzzle. They weren't really sure what it was. Uh, and then over time, legend grew. And of course, uh, it became the, uh, you know, commonly accepted fact that whoever would untie this really complex knot uh, would actually become the leader of all Asia. So. Does anybody know who this is? I heard one person, okay, Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great, uh, born in Greece, uh, well, probably one of, considered to be one of the greatest generals of all time, uh, world conqueror, uh, and quite an innovative thinker. Uh, and uh, you know, he, he had a, a very um, tumultuous up upbringing, a very ambitious guy. Uh, and he had um, a lot of expectations for what he intended to do in the future. In fact, when he ascended uh, the throne, he basically made um, pretty much no, um, uh, no bones about that his intention was to uh, basically go and conquer pretty much everybody. Um, so that's pretty much what he did. He took off uh, and decided he was going to go and visit Macedonia. And uh, at the time, you know, the, 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 the story, as the story goes, he didn't actually know about the Gordian Knot or the lore or the uh, whatever behind it. Uh, and he actually showed up uh, in the town of Gordia. Uh, and this, by the way, is a, is a, is a painting. Um, it's by a guy named um, Giovanni Panini. He's not the same guy who created the sandwich. Uh, it's, uh, Giovanni Panini is, um, uh, this painting's actually in Baltimore. And what he's showing here is actually a picture of Alexander the Great standing there next to this knot. Well, you'll notice he actually has his sword out. And for some reason, uh, everybody always thought that the way that you had to fix this problem was actually to try and you know, gradually untie it. Well, Alexander the Great kind of walked up to it, apparently spent about two hours thinking about it, developed a plan, and then just took out his sword and actually cut it in half. And then lo and behold, he went on to conquer the rest of Asia, and you guys know the story from there. You know what, application portfolio transformation is actually not all that different. Uh, there is bold thinking, uh, that, that uh, you need to have, for sure. You need to have tools to be able to do it. Uh, I believe you know, firmly that, that um, there have been some evolutionary, revolutionary ideas that have come up, particularly with the advent of open source, that have really begun to make a difference about how it is that people think about this problem uh, and how it is we can fix it together. Uh, and then there's certainly you know, sort of the, the, um, the aspirations of agility uh, and cost reduction uh, that's out there in the future. Um, I think the real challenge here is getting started and developing something that turns into a really good plan. And Alexander the Great had a very similar philosophy about things. Failure to plan is a plan to fail. Uh, and certainly, you know, I, I can't say that he necessarily came up with a brilliant plan. Um, in, you know, in a few minutes he stood there staring at this lovely Gordian knot. Uh, but what he did do um, is really think outside the box about how is it that I actually address this problem. Uh, and this is the way we like to look at it too. Uh, when we're talking to our, to our clients is to bring kind of the best thinking of what is it that the cloud can offer, what is it that open source can offer, how is it that we can go uh, and attack your application portfolio and think about it a little bit differently. Now the cost problems and some of the challenges that our CIOs um, are, are facing and some of our clients are facing when we discuss with them are really quite overwhelming in some cases. Um, I was working with a client not too long ago. Uh, they had um, a collection of business systems, nearly a thousand of them. Uh, and uh, they had uh, 18 different invoicing applications. And I can kind of get my arms around like two or three. I can kind of understand there might be some, you know, some specific things out there, but 18 seemed a little bit high for me. And this is a manufacturer. They had some leasing business and some other things. And uh, you know, they were telling me about a, a story about when they had some tax changes uh, that it basically required them months and months of work um, or an army of people basically to go in and apply those tax changes and deal with that in their invoicing systems. Remarkable. Uh, so their competitors are able to deal with that kind of stuff agile very quickly. They're sort of all encumbered uh, with all these different systems that they've acquired via merger and acquisition or poor governance, uh, and they can't get through it. So that's the challenge and the thing that we're trying to tackle uh, with going through and doing this rationalization exercise. And there's a, key, a few key things to really think about here. One of them is building some momentum earlier and getting some, some quick wins in this. A lot of times, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we find one in three applications are actually redundant or even unused. 
um, you can really turn off some unused applications and really begin to actually save some cost. Uh, you'd be surprised the goodwill that actually begins to earn you from the business, provided you actually archive it and preserve the data in the right way. I think another key thing is actually engaging and aligning uh, your business. You know, this is a type of thing that if it's done inside of just the, you know, the, um, uh, the IT organization, it's sort of destined to become shelfware. Don't want that to happen. You want them to be engaged in it. You want to and make sure that they're aware. You can actually serve them better in the future, um, provide them better capability and service more quickly. Um, you can introduce them new channel, to new channels like mobility if you allow them an opportunity to go in and transform their application portfolio. I think the other thing is you can't leave the barn door open um, after the horse has already left either. Is that if you're going to do this and you're going to start fixing your portfolio, you better put something on the back end of it to make sure that it's going to be kept in a better shape when you're done. And um, you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, bailing out a sinking ship uh, if you're not doing that. So there's an element of governance and other things here. But really the key thing that this boils down to is you have to go through pretty much everything. And I don't recommend trying to boil the ocean on these things. What we try to do is usually pick like a functional silo or even a vertical um, of uh, uh, maybe a technology plane or otherwise and say here's what we should go after first and then we get some momentum there and we'll move on. And what we try to do is to actually assign uh, recommendations or what we call dispositions to each one of these different uh, applications that are, that are in that portfolio. We recommend replacement. Of course, Accenture likes to recommend re replacement. In fact, my, my, uh, pre the previous presenter from SAP likes us when, when we do that as well. Um, retiring, uh, that's certainly one. Consolidation, remediation, replatform, and migrating. You go through and you do that, you'd be surprised you can actually slim down your portfolio pretty well. And if you're really aggressive and you want to take a look at process re-engineering or actually process optimization, uh, you may even have better luck from that. The rubber really hits the road, though, when you actually execute these things. And this is where things get kind of interesting, and you can bring in some of the innovation of our partners and some of the other uh, ecosystem of, of uh, providers that we work with uh, in Accenture. And what I, what I see inside of here is almost a renaissance of what can happen. In the last couple of years, uh, and for a long time before that, in the last couple of years, um, I had seen a lot of clients beginning to ask uh, Accenture about, um, you know, we're stuck in these legacy applications. Um, we've got COBOL, we've got PL1, RPG, whatever it might be, and me being the modernization guy, I'm like, no, 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 you're not stuck there. That's a good thing. Modernization is good. We can keep you in those languages. And what I began to realize over time is, actually, that's not the right answer for everybody. Certainly, you can keep them um, in, those, uh, in those environments and languages, and they can continue to be very productive. Um, however, in some cases, there's just fundamental differences about what they require in the future. Now, this audience here, you guys are already evangelists of Java and being able to move to open source and others. But quite honestly, not everybody in the world is there at this point. Well, when we begin to look at things like uh, clients want new channels like mobility or otherwise, and being able to enable those things in some of the more legacy application systems that are out there, it's just not possible. Um, or anything's possible with unlimited time and money, I suppose, but it's really just not possible. When we take a look at the different architectures that are available and some of the advances uh, in, in the way that we look at things, the way that our ecosystem of partners do, you know, we've come up with some really unique ways to attack this migration. And this is where I'm uh, very excited about what's happening inside of OpenShift, and we certainly have had this heritage for some time now uh, with, what, uh, with what occurs inside of Red Hat Linux. But for the migration standpoint, one of the things that we can do now is we can take some of those older legacy languages. So give us your, your procedural languages, give us your uh, 4GL uh, type languages, and we can actually extract from them the business rules and logic put it into a platform independent model, and then we can forward engineer it onto new applications. Now, we've all been through the language migration process before. I assume many of you guys in here have been here, and probably everybody knows the joke of, you know, what do you get when you convert COBOL to, to, to Java? Does anybody know that joke? Joe Ball? Apparently only funny for the legacy mi modernization uh, crowd. But this is actually, a very, very, very seriously, this is actually a real, a, a real problem. You can't make Java procedural. It just doesn't work. And quite honestly, that's why Accenture, for such a long time, we'd avoided doing that kind of work. It just didn't, didn't work very well. Now we're using uh, technologies to allow us to do model-driven development and really just forward engineer applications from uh, basically extracted UML and the legacy. They're actually much better. And I'm not going to kid you. There's a lot of sausage making in the middle there. There's a lot of work that has to be done. There's a lot of testing. But we can take our clients 
Family Jewels applications, their most important business systems at the core of their enterprise, and we can actually take them and move them to more modern languages. And you know what? I can do it on .NET, I can do it on Java Spring, and pretty soon I can do it to platform as a service architectures as well. Um, in fact, we've already done one of them, and I'm intending to do OpenShift pretty soon. So this is really, this is technology that's not, you know, uh, brand new. Um, it's been around for a while. It's matured to the point where I think that the enterprises are getting comfortable uh, that this is how we could use and execute it. I'd say the other scenario is replatforming at scale that we run into uh, a fair bit. And, and this is where we take uh, legacy uh, systems um, and, we, and we will migrate them to something that's a little bit more um, architecturally consistent with where our clients want to be in the future. And when we're doing this, we always have to do it kind of with an end game in mind. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to end up with that same Gordian knot that we had before. We want to make our applications more interoperable. Um, we want to make sure that they um, uh, allow us to integrate with them easier. If it's uh, service enablement or otherwise, we want to put all those capabilities in place. And we want to reap the benefits of open source as part of that. And I think that replatforming at scale has really gotten to that. Now, for a long time, people have been moving things to Linux, or they've been moving uh, applications off of um, you know, traditional application servers, perhaps on a JBoss, or perhaps they even started on JBoss in the first place. Uh, and we really gotten to a point that we're really factory uh, enabled this and industrialized it. We've taken sort of the rules of what works um, in one platform, uh, and we understand that and we know what works in the target platform. We've industrialized that. We have tools that actually migrate things from A to B now. Um, so what we end up with is actually not just dealing with Java, but we deal with pretty much every language. You know, we, I recently did some work like this for a client where they had, let's see, C, COBOL, um, they had Informix 4GL, they had everything under the sun on basically running on a, a legacy Unix, it was AIX uh, platform. And for anybody here who's ever done anything where they move something from AIX onto Red Hat Linux, you know that C just doesn't work like C uh, does on, on Linux. And it's actually a lot of work to do that kind of stuff. And you've got to make sure that you test it thoroughly and you get it done. The more that you can do to automate this and fix the rules into an engine, the higher quality you're going to get and the better off you're going to be in the long run. And that's the, that's the library of procedures that we've built over time to be able to really industrialize this and do it right. So our mission here is really to take the open source community, take the capabilities of Red Hat and OpenShift, and what we're doing is we're trying to take a look at, at the big picture, not the trees of applications, but rather the forest, and how do we take that and actually transform it. And it's applying some capabilities like this, along with retiring and decommissioning, um, along with replacement in some cases, or consolidation, and actually building a better enterprise uh, for our clients. So one of the things that, that really strikes me about um, when we're uh, doing portfolio transformation or we come in and we do an analysis is that everybody's not is a little bit different. You know, some of our clients, uh, they have you know, uh, issues where um, they're tied up on a legacy platform, uh, which is a, a pretty common thing. Um, that we run into. Others have cost issues and they're needing to cut their portfolio. Um, others have found segments of their business that they're no longer interested in. Sometimes they're trying to merge or integrate uh, other clients. So I, one of the things that, that we've tried to do is just to be very adaptable uh, to this and just recognize that everybody's knot's going to be a little bit different. So you can't come in, you know, just with your sword in every case and kind of cut the knot open. You really have to figure out whether it's a knife, is it a sword, do you need a hacksaw, what exactly is it that's going to help you uh, get from A to B. But one of the things that, that, um, that we really, you know, try to, to emphasize here is, is that the, you know, some of the capabilities that are offered and we'll say the catalyst of the cloud uh, as well as open source and some of the cost savings that are, that are possible there, but not just focus on the cost savings, but also the business agility that's delivered, that these are really the important elements to consider as you're part starting to deliver some of these things. And I think that the ecosystem of folks that are in here, uh, along with Accenture, you know, we have a mission in front of us to go and address this problem. Because seriously, the Fortune 500, the Fortune 2000 that's out there, they're really struggling with this. How do they continue to be competitive and cost effective and responsive to their business, as well as to regulatory pressures, uh, and are able to maintain and support their portfolio in the right way. So hopefully, during the course of, of our chat today, I've inspired some of you to be a little bit more uh, Alexander the Greatish in your thinking. Um, and I don't, I, I don't imagine that probably anybody here has aspirations to go and maybe conquer the world. Um, but 
let's, let's face it, what Alexander the Great really did here was he just applied a little bit of common sense to fixing a really difficult problem. And it was not something that, that you know, the way that I look at, at things um, you know, should you know, result in him becoming you know, sort of leader of the known world at the time. But the reality is uh, that we all have these tools already. You know, these tools exist. Uh, you've got partners like Accenture and some of the other integration partners that are out there, certainly Red Hat uh, and others that we work with, and then, of course, you know, our clients uh, that we can help to untangle those portfolios and create a better enterprise in the future, one that's more agile, one that's more nimble, and even moving into the cloud. Now, yesterday I was here in Boston. I was meeting with a client, and we were talking about one of their critical business systems. They're, they're actually in the, in the trading business. And they had developed uh, basically the system, you know, they have, you know, like many of us uh, have encountered uh, in, in times, they've got a business unit that's particularly technology adept, and they built a system that sort of outgrew grew its britches, so to speak. And um, this particular system was really important for them because what it did was it actually calculated the value of their trading portfolio. So you can imagine the scrutiny something like that is under with additional microscopes that are on the Securities and Exchange Commission, and all these things are going on right now. Well, this is a really important system. Um, you know, it did um, all kinds of, of uh, sophisticated um, statistical analysis on the valuation of their, of their particular portfolio, um, how it is that they were going to run these different simulations. They actually ran approximately 10,000 of them basically to arrive at this different valuation. Uh, and their traders were basically saying, this is no longer adequate to meet our needs. We've got to do something different to fix this. Meanwhile. They want to go and buy more servers. They want to buy more infrastructure to be able to support this. We want to run 20,000 simulations uh, now. And I, I encouraged them. I said, you really need to think about this you know, maybe differently than what before. And I realized that you guys have not really embraced or adopted cloud architecture at this point. But if there was ever a perfect use case for it, this is it. And encourage them to go and take that initial step. And by doing that, you're going to begin to create that momentum uh, around embracing and rationalizing what's inside their portfolio and creating a better architecture and enterprise for them. So what they're intending to do now is to actually take that application, take that uh, very important mark-to-market um, -market application for themselves, they're going to move it into a cloud architecture. And you know what? It's not just going to improve the throughput for them and the accuracy that they've got. They're actually going to be able to make better trading decisions because now, instead of being a batch process, it's actually going to be closer to real time, and they're going to understand their position at any point during the day as opposed to each morning. It's up to all of us to figure out what those business imperatives are because on the basis alone of cost savings, we're not going to be successful in transforming some of these enterprises. There's a need to be more agile, there's a need to be more nimble, but it has to be balanced with what are the business results that are actually delivered out of it. And I think it's that type of innovation and thinking. It's applying the extract and transform of application languages. It's applying industrialization in, lang in um, uh, replatforming and applying rules to automatically fix code so it runs on a new platform. Uh, and it's about thinking about how elasticity in, in cloud computing is actually going to provide a, a difference for them. I think if you do that, and you may not have ambitions to be, you know, like I said, a, a world leader in the future, I think if you do that and you take those basic steps, I think maybe you'll find yourself on a marble bust 2,000 years from now. There you go. So thank you. You've been, uh, you've been incredibly tolerant of my bad jokes and also my, uh, my um, uh, marble bust. And uh, you know, hopefully my colleagues from, from Red Hat um, will work with me in the future because my uh, intention here is to take uh, what we're doing with portfolio optimization and modernization uh, and actually be, enable our clients to actually move their, their critical business systems, whether they're legacy Java uh, or even uh, written in some of the other legacy languages, procedural, uh, or GL and otherwise, and actually enable our clients to move them directly onto OpenShift. And we have big ambitions for that, and we have big intentions to do that in the future. Thank you. Appreciate it.